On June 28th, my husband Howard and I will celebrate our 30th anniversary. It's a little hard to believe that 30 years have gone by, but they have been good years, and we have two terrific daughters now in their 20s. In fact, these last 30 years have been my favorite years so far. So I guess that means my marriage is going well, right? Yeah, of course, right. Absolutely. But come on, what couple doesn't have their ups and downs, disagreements, hurtful moments, those nights when you both go to bed mad, many times due to a simple reason. You didn't take the time to talk or you were afraid to. To help celebrate my 30th anniversary and to honor all couples everywhere, we are replaying this episode that aired back in February on Valentine's Day, because I truly believe that if everyone tuned into this episode and really listened and really took the advice being offered by my guest, Dr. Rosie Shrout, oh, what a wonderful world it would be. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Gruff Talk, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. Back in the 50s, the very popular magazine, Ladies Home Journal, ran a column called, Can This Marriage Be Saved? It was one of the most read magazine columns in the history of magazine columns, Well, since I knew that this episode would air on Valentine's Day, I thought it made sense to pick up on where Can This Marriage Be Saved left off and focus on a topic that could help couples get closer and yes, maybe even save their marriages, better communication with your partner. Yep, that is the key. You all know that I'm a research junkie, and a few weeks ago, I came across a new study stating that if one or both partners in a relationship avoids tough conversations about tough things, it could create emotional distress, bad feelings about the relationship, chronic inflammation, and can mess around with their immune system. So not good. So not good. Yes, bad communication skills between partners is not only one of the top 10 causes of divorce, but it can also wreak havoc with your health. The good news here, and we love good news, is that this is fixable. My guest today is the lead author of a new study showing that when committed couples communicate with each other in negative ways, even something as innocuous seeming as rolling your eyes both partners and women in particular suffer emotionally and their immune systems plummet, affecting overall health and well being and happiness. This topic really deserves our attention because there are steps everyone can take to try to fix the most common communication challenges. And my guest today will talk through the best ones that you can put into action starting today. Dr. Rosie Shrout is an assistant professor of human development and family science at Purdue University. She also leads the Relationships and Health Lab, and her primary focus in studying how stress affects couples' relationships and their overall health. Lots to talk about, so let's get this conversation started. Hello, hello. My guest today is Dr. Rosie Shroud, Assistant Professor of Human Development and Family Science at Purdue University. She leads the Relationships and Health Lab and studies how stress can impact people's relationships, their psychological health, but also their physical health, both in the short term and the long term. So hello, Dr. Shroud, and welcome to Gruff Talk. Thank you. Hi, it's so good to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. So today is a very special day. It is Valentine's Day, February 14th, and that's why you and I thought this would be a really important conversation to have. You know, most of the Gruff Talk audience is women, 45 and over, although we do get a lot of men listening in too. But so you could imagine that a lot of them have been in committed relationships for, say, 20 years or more. And what can happen at that point is maybe you get a little bit lazy in how you communicate with each other. And that could add stress to the relationship, according to your research. So I really want to talk about what's going on with 
couples and what's happening to their psychological health, their relationships, and also their physical health, especially women. So let's get talking also about how we can help them get back on track with how they communicate with each other and with their relationships on this very, very special day. In a recent article, Dr. Shrout, you were quoted as saying, marriage is associated with better health but chronically distressed marriages can worsen health for both partners, but especially women. So Dr. Shrout, you're the lead author of a new study focusing on how poor communication between committed partners can really negatively impact their health and well-being and specifically their immune systems. Your research revisits data from a 2005 Ohio State University study that showed how stress Couples feel during a brief, even a brief argument can like have an impact on how their wounds heal, which I found extraordinary. And truly, it was a landmark study at that time. So you did revisit this and, of course, came out with some new research. Tell us about the original study and your reanalysis of it, please. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a study, like you said, landmark, 2005 study that one of my mentors led. And it, I mean, it's one of those studies when I read it, I was just like, this, this is what I want to do. <laughs> like, this is the research that I want to do. This is, it invigorated my interests in relationships and health to begin with as, as someone in grad school. And so then to fast forward 10 or so years later and to be able to work with Jan and reanalyze this data was just like a dream come true. So this study It was just a landmark study showing that couples' hostile behaviors during marital discussions were associated with slower wound healing. So couples and spouses who were more hostile during lab discussions, their wounds healed at 60% the rate of couples who were less hostile. And so just me, Doc, for one second, can you just like define hostile? Is that something that like very aggressive with each other? Or could it be subtle? Could it be like a passive aggressive comment? Just kind of explain that a little bit more. Yeah. So things like eye rolling. Oh, that's a key behavior. Wow. Negative behavior. Yeah. You know, using a negative tone of voice. So they're labeled as hostile, but people might not think, oh, I don't do that. But they're common behaviors that people do when they're having tough discussions. Um, so yeah, using a negative tone of voice, rolling your eyes, even though you don't mean to, you're not trying to to do that, but they're just behaviors that we typically do that sometimes go unnoticed by ourselves, but can truly have these harmful consequences for couples' relationships and health. Mm-hmm. So continue with what you were saying about your re- revisiting that uh, study. Yeah, so we were really interested in what happens outside of the lab? So like on a daily basis, the way couples are communicating, the communication patterns they bring into the lab, how did that contribute to their wounds healing? And so the first thing we did was we looked at just their baseline inflammation. So before they were even exposed to any sort of wound healing or engaged in any sort of conflict, when they came into the lab, it just took some blood to be able to look at inflammatory markers. And what we found was that couples who had more negative communication patterns on a day-to-day basis, they had higher levels of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so their immune systems were already sort of um, not as well off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's these things, we specifically looked at people's behaviors, like how much they were demanding and withdrawing. And so this is a common but destructive behavior. So it's usually one partner is pressing an issue. They're really trying to have a conversation. They're pushing it maybe a little too firmly, a little too aggressively. And the other partner is withdrawing. They are pulling back. They don't want to have this conversation. Mm. They've gone quiet. And in particular, what we saw was that husbands demanding and wives withdrawing in those couples, they had higher inflammation than in the couples that didn't report this. Interesting. And uh, do we have any reasons to why this is happening? Well, what I found to be interesting too here is that we found a gender difference actually. And so it was particularly um, notable for women. So for women, when their husbands were demanding and the wives were withdrawing, they had higher inflammation. This effect, when we looked a little further, was not significant for the men. And so I think that there's something going on here with gender. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And we can, you know, spend some time talking about these gender differences too. But I think here is this especially showing how destructive, negative, typical communication can wear on women's health and get under the skin to influence their health. Mm -hmm. I'm really surprised when you, you know, gave us the definition of hostile behavior where something as simple as rolling your eyes or maybe turning away or showing any of the signs that you're kind of, like you said, retreating from the conversation can have that kind of physical impact is mind blowing to me. I was expecting you to say something much more aggressive in their behavior. So this is uh, <laughs> really, really incredible. And you wrote a terrific article, which I read in The Conversation, which is a website I think everybody should follow. We will have links to all of these in the show notes, everyone. So you should definitely check this out. And it was about how one's stress can actually be contagious. And you even created a, di which was so impressive, a diagnostic model for analyzing this. Can you talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just someone who's interested in, in couples relationships and how they're engaging and behaving with one another mm -hmm. and knowing, well, how does my partner's behavior affect me biologically? And so we've seen with stress that stress can typically get under our own skin. When we're stressed, you know, we have higher levels of inflammation, we have higher cortisol levels. And so it can affect us in multiple ways. And I wanted to know, well, what happens when my partner is stressed and we still try to have a tough conversation. We, we might try to have a disagreement or an argument. So that combination of my partner stressed and we also have some sort of disagreement together. How does that affect me biologically? And so we did look at cortisol specifically. Mm -hmm. This is a hormone. It's a stress hormone that sometimes gets a bad rap. Like it's all bad, but it's, it's not true. Like cortisol is so important. It gets us out of bed. It has really important functions and it starts right. high. It keeps us going. <laughs> it keeps us going. Yes. Yes. And typically, you know, we see people's cortisol starting high when they wake up, gets them out of bed and it declines across the day. But stress can lead to these dysregulated patterns like cortisol not really declining as much and staying more elevated. So in other words, that's the goal. I mean, you want it to be or you expect it to be at a high level when you get up in the morning and then you want it to be lower during the day because that means that you're not being stressed, correct? Yeah, your body is just, it's adapting. Cortisol is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's right. fire, you know, it's getting your the rest of your regulatory systems to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's helping our brains, it's helping our immune system, it's helping us throughout our days. And what we did is, again, is very similar to the wound study. Couples came into the lab, they engaged in a, a discussion together to try to resolve one of their biggest disagreements. And we were able to look at their cortisol across that day. And what we found was that couples at the beginning of the day, partners had pretty similar cortisol levels regardless of their partner stress. But by the end of that day, so about eight hours later, four hours after the conflict, the people with stressed partners had higher cortisol levels than the, those with less stressed partners. Incredible. And so engaging in a conflict discussion and having a partner who was stressed. So doing this with a stressed partner had biological consequences for mm -hmm. a person's own body. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, well, on many, many levels, but also it's interesting to me, maybe that means that there is a very deep connection, that you're really being empathetic to the point where you're actually taking on the stress that that person that you, you know, hopefully love or really care for is feeling. Is that one of the things that we can extrapolate from this? Yeah, absolutely. And so there's, I mean, there's some cool research out there showing the synchrony in couples and their emotions and their physiology and sort of mm -hmm. being susceptible to each other's emotions. And this is, I think, an example of how stress could be contagious and how, yes, you might, you know, I mean, I think about like couples when they, when stress is running high, like tension is already running high, you're more likely to bicker. And it kind of, you're going back and forth and you're bickering and now you're picking up on each other's stress. And that, I think exactly like what you're saying is that it ended up having an impact on the other person, even when they didn't walk into that conversation as stressed. As stressed, right. And, you know, there is another layer here, especially for Gruff Talk listeners. And that is, we know that women who are going through menopause, perimenopause, or even, you know, postmenopausal can 
have elevated cortisol levels very, very often during this particular journey in life, which could be adding for that age group, you know, when we're talking about this, could be adding to the issues as well. So I just wanted to add that in, everyone. Uh, you and your colleagues also did research about, you know, we do a lot of research about married couples, but those who are in committed relationships tend to be healthier especially men. And we've heard this before, but you have some new research about that. Talk to us about that. And why is that? Why are men healthier when they're in committed relationships? Yeah, I mean, this is the question that just drives my work. We've seen that married spouses have better health, they're happier than those who aren't married. And we're seeing that these effects tend to be stronger for men compared to women. Mm -hmm. And I think there there's a few reasons that go into this. I mean, first off, the way that we typically socialize both men and women, especially in our country, we're socializing women to be thinking about their relationships, to be monitoring them. And their relationships have important implications for their own self-perceptions. Mm-hmm. And when things are going a lot well. Of, a lot of comparisons are made as well, I'm sure. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, exactly, exactly. And so when things aren't going as well, or you're experiencing conflict, or you're experiencing stress in your relationship, that for women, it's a little bit more personal. They think, you know, it reflects back on us. Mm -hmm. And so it can get under the skin a little bit more. Whereas for men, we're not socializing them as much as to be as interpersonally oriented. So relationships for them, you know, women are the ones who are often burdened with trying to resolve things. If there's an issue, sometimes it falls on the woman relative to a man. Mm -hmm. And so there are already the way that if you're experiencing conflict, then whose problem is that to solve? <laughs> and here we're seeing in a lot of work that it's it's on the woman. Mm-hmm. So let's give our listeners some good news because there is good news. And I quote you, you recently said, all is not lost. There are lots of options that couples can use like education or therapy, of course, to help them become better at communicating with each other. You know, so you've got like people who are in different phases of life with their partner, right? You've got the newlyweds, of course, which you reference in your research and your articles. But again, the Gruff Talk audience, uh, for the most part, are people who may have been in committed relationships for decades or a little bit longer than newlyweds. And so there are a lot of different kind of points in life and different things happening in your life that might be adding to all of this stress that adds to, you know, the the psychological and physical issues as a result. But what can we do? Now, I'd like to offer one thing up. I found this um, recently and I thought it was really fascinating. There are two little words that people can use much more regularly, which will help in the relationship better than anything else that they've come up with. And I want to share it with all of you. And that is to say, thank you. Because as it turns out, one of the leading causes of divorce in this country is because one or both of the the partners feel underappreciated, unappreciated, like they don't feel like they're getting the, the credit that they deserve. They're being taken advantage of or taken for granted. And by saying, thank you, to them for little things even make such a big difference. That's just one thing I want to throw out to everyone on this very special Valentine's Day chat that we're having is that, you know, think about that. We stop thinking about that, especially when we've been together for so long. So Dr. Shrout, what are some thoughts you have on this? Yeah. I mean, I love that, you know, showing appreciation, saying thank you, really being a good friend to your partner and showing your care and concern. And I think that's a, that's a great thing for people to consider on this Valentine's day. And I think too, you know, you mentioned all of the other things that we have to do across our life course. And, and especially as, as we get older Mm -hmm. and another factor too, to when thinking about why marriage can sometimes not have as strong benefits for women is some of the the structural issues that go into it, right? So you also have like the pay gap and gender inequality. So those things add up over time. Yes. Thinking about the the second shift, women spend two more hours a day on housework than men. 
Right. 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 And I just want to add to that, that again, for this particular demographic that we're talking to and about is you also have, uh, you know, child rearing responsibilities, as you pointed out, house, more housework. And then as you get older, you think, okay, great. Kids are out, they're in college or they've moved on and they're adulting. And uh, now my life can get a little bit easier. And then you have aging parents to focus on as well. And I know that was my own experience. And I know that's the experience of so many women. So that adds to the stress. It just adds to every day, kind of like this background hum of stress. And then when you, yes. you know, go into a potentially stressful conversation with your partner, well, all hell can break loose. No question yes. about it. So I want to also kind of focus on the things we talked about before. I think everyone needs to pay more attention to those little acts of maybe, I don't know, would you call them passive aggressiveness? You know, maybe I'm using that too loosely, but the eye rolling the eye rolling, mm -hmm. the physically turning away, the looking annoyed. I mean, you're not doing anything physically to your partner. You're not even saying anything to your partner at that point. But those actions can be really cruel, clearly, based on your research, right? So yeah. I think everyone needs to pay attention to that. Absolutely. These behaviors, keeping in you know, mind our own behaviors, as well as what we're seeing when we're having these discussions with our partners. And, you know, in our research, we have looked at couples over 16 years of marriage. And then what we found was for women, the more topics that they argued about over the 16 years, the worse their health was 16 years later. Oh, and so I think that's there's heartbreaking. a lot. It is. It is. And I think there's a lot at play here. I think learning to have these conversations is so important and learning to do it productively, like you're saying. And so paying attention to the way that we're behaving in these conversations. So first, you know, bringing up things when they're important to you. I've even heard, you know, people say, don't sweat the small stuff. When in fact, research shows sweat the small stuff. If something is upsetting to you, bring it up. We sometimes try to protect our partners by yes. not bringing something up. And it's actually more beneficial to sit down, have a conversation and talk about things that you would like to see changed or something that's on your mind and you need support for. And I think asking for it, saying, I want to have a conversation and I just want support. I don't actually want problem solving. I'm here because I'm emotionally upset. I just want to have this conversation with you and for you to listen and provide care. And I think that's so important to one, to tell people what your expectations are up front. And then over time, you can learn those without having to always say, you know, I'm looking for emotional support. <laughs> you could, you know, when you are listening to someone, I just read something recently that said, if someone is coming to you for emotional support and you find yourself saying the word, you know, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, but <laughs> say because, <laughs> say because instead of but, right? Yes. I'm so, I'm Huge so sorry to difference. hear that happen. Yes, because I know how hard you worked on something. Yes. That one word change I heard, I was just like, yes, that is such a good thing for people to do to show that responsiveness, that care, that understanding that is really behind so much of this health benefit that we get yep. from good and strong relationships. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I know you've written about this too, but that is such a great tip. And I know that personally, because you know sometimes if I'm really upset about something, and I go to my husband to discuss it, really all I want from him at that moment in time is for him to say, oh, I'm so sorry that that's happening right now. Add the because. But then he very often, because he's a problem solver yeah. and that's his nature, he wants to just yeah. like, now, well, here's what you should do. And then it, it escalates and then I'm even more upset. But we have worked on this. That's the good news. By talking yes. it through and having him get more comfortable with being in more of the supportive role, not the problem solving role. And with me being a little bit more okay, if he starts to head in that direction. And by the way, I know we're talking about committed couples at this point, but this skill, and it is a skill, this tool also works very well with any 
interpersonal relationship, whether it's Absolutely. with a friend, like I say, I call my girlfriend and I complain about something. I just want her to comfort me and not tell me how to fix it unless I ask for it. That's something else, of course. And that's true of my relationship with my two daughters who are in their twenties. Very often they just want to you know, share with me how upset they are about something. And of course, being a mom, I immediately want to try to fix it and make it better for them. And I've learned by having very open discussions with them about this, that that's not always what they want. So this is a, a great tool, everyone, for any interpersonal relationship that you have. So thank you, Dr. Shroud, for bringing that up. Yeah, I think it's so important. And I think too, exactly what you're saying is you're having these conversations and figuring out what it is you need, what it is you want when you're having these conversations. And I think that's so important for women, especially of generations that might not have been told or taught to tell people what you want. That's right. Tell people what you need. Right. And so, and we're seeing this like graying of divorce, it's called. So yes, generations are now, you know, and I think there's a lot at play here. I think there's, I mean, historically thinking about women's rights. I mean, marriage was sort of designed for many reasons. And, and one is for women to, women didn't have right, rights to like a bank account, right? Women didn't nope. have rights. I think to, that all changed uh, in the seventies or eighties. I mean, it's 70s, really rather yeah. recently, yeah. which is just unbelievable, yeah. but there you have it. Exactly. Like we get our health insurance through marriage yes. if we're not working, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a lot of structural things that go into marriage and why it can be beneficial. But for women, especially, they didn't have the rights that they, we had now have, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And so I think as women are getting older and they're saying, I don't need to stay in a bad relationship because now I have these rights myself, they're able to say what they want, say what they need. And sometimes that means leaving a bad relationship. But yeah. I think for those who are trying to have a good relationship and they're wanting to improve it, it means doing something that might not be comfortable. And it's telling our partners what it is we need yes, and why we need it, how that could improve our relationship. And then asking, what else can I do? to be a better partner to you so that it's going both ways. Right. Exactly. I'm so glad you brought that up too, because there was, uh, you probably heard of it. There was um, a magazine called Ladies Home Journal that was around for, for decades and decades and decades. It was really like kind of the epitome of the fifties, right? Life. They had a very popular section called, can this marriage be saved? And they would offer up, you know, of course, the, what was timely for the time, information to try to save the marriage. In my mind, this is information, everyone. If you have decided, you know, here I am, I'm 50, I'm 45, I'm 60. I do want to stay. I don't want to be part of that great divorce. I am committed to this person, whoever this person is, then you should make it better. You know, do what you can do with your partner by using these tools and being aware of things that you might be doing that have been contributing to this stress in the relationship. So it's super, super important. But, you know, at some point, if you feel that this marriage can't be saved, <laughs> well, then, you know, that's a whole different discussion. But for this purpose today, I really wanted yeah. to focus more on people who are saying, yeah, I'm committed. I just don't want the stress anymore. What can we do? So really, really, really super important and great tools. You know, Dr. Shout, this was an incredibly wonderful, informative, lively conversation that really had to be had. And I, I hope you'll come back and share more research that you will continue to do with all of us, uh, especially today. Maybe we'll make it an annual thing every Valentine's Day you'll be on <laughs> I the love show. It. I love it. That would be so fun. So fun. Can I right? say, yeah, yeah, please. Can I say one more thing of to bring course. it back to the And you have to, to also give us three takeaways before you go too, but sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, this had me thinking too about the wound healing study. So mm. bringing it back to that study. Yes. And this whole idea of avoiding conversations and, and not bringing things up. And I think it's even more important to bring things up because in that study, and when we revisited the analysis, what we found was that the partners who avoided conversations, typically on a day-to-day -day basis, they avoided tough conversations. 
their wounds healed more slowly than couples who were less avoidant. And even when those couples were more positive in the lab, they were doing these positive behaviors, they were supporting, they were showing appreciation, acceptance. If they avoided conversations in daily life, they still had slower wound healing. Incredible. Absolutely. And so, you know, avoidance can can actually get under the skin. It can have an effect on relationships. It can have an effect on immune systems. So having those conversations and doing it constructively are so, so important. So important. And really, if everyone, if you feel you can't do this on your own, seek out a good therapist to help you with this discussion between either you alone or together. But it's, it's as you can hear from Dr. Schrout's research and what she just said, it is very, very important. So Dr. Shrout, give us your three, I mean, you said so many things, so many things that we could all take away from this, but what are the three things you really want the Gruff Talk audience to remember from this conversation today? Oh, such a good question. Okay. Can they be three new things? Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Go for it. Okay. (laughs) I'll have three, three tips. Yes, please. Three other things that you could do. Yeah. All right. So one. Put the phone down, Mm. put the phone down and have that conversation with your partner and ask them to put their phone down out of sight, put it out of sight, look into each other's eyes and have a conversation. Another one, compliment them. Today's Valentine's Day, compliment people, compliment your partner, compliment someone, tell them you like their shirt, whatever it is that you like, tell people. And another is to affirm them. Mm -hmm. When something is going on, affirm them. Be there for them and show them that you are there by their side. Celebrate the wins. When someone comes home, your partner comes home and they had the best day at work, sit there and show enthusiasm and smile and ask questions and celebrate the joy together. Oh, such good tips on Valentine's Day. I want to like reach through the camera and give you a great big (laughs) hug. (laughs) I loved all those tips. They're so great. Can I add one too? And that one is to say thank you. To say thank you. On a regular basis, say thank you. And I want to say thank you to you, Dr. Shroud. And I'm going to wish you a very, very happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Gruff Talk, please do two things. First, share it with all your friends and family and subscribe to Gruff Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Until next time, remember this, we can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.